Fantastic. Thanks for having me, Julie. Thanks for having me, all of you. It's great to be here with you. Um, even as we see the light at the end of the tunnel of this terrible pandemic, it's great to bask in some of the opportunities that have we've learned how to notice and dive into because of the pandemic. And hopefully opportunities like this to learn Torah with people from all over the country and the world will continue afterward. It's a real joy to be here. I uh, love seeing people post in the chat where they're, uh, where they're joining from. So it's been a couple of weeks since we uh, tapped into the regular flow of the Torah. The last two weeks, we stepped out um, into the Yitziat Mitzrayim, the Exodus story, for the beginning and the end of Pesach, um, actually focusing on the Exodus itself and on the crossing of the sea. And it takes a little bit of mental gymnastics or stretching sometimes to remember where we were last time. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start us with the background to this week's Parsha. We actually left on somewhat of a cliffhanger. It's an underrated cliffhanger in the Torah, in my opinion. It's one of these things that like, like a movie that doesn't do too well at the box office at the time, but is actually like a cult hit later on. And people think like, this is actually the most exciting thing in the whole Torah. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, oops, wrong. Okay. All right. So we're going to be focusing on in today's part, so why did Nadav and Avihu die? But we are not ready for that yet. We've been stuck in Pesach mode, in Exodus mode. We need to backtrack a little bit. At the end of Parshat Sav, the end of chapter 8 of Vayikra, we had had um, Moshe was giving um, detailed, meticulous instructions to Aharon, the high priest, Moshe's brother, and to his sons for how to prepare the erection of the Mishkan, um, the tabernacle. Remember toward the end of the book of Exodus of Shemot, we had the people bringing, voluntarily bringing forth all their offerings to, to the point that they had to be told to stop bringing stuff in order to build the gold and the silver, the fabrics, to build this portable temple so that God can have a, a home dwelling among them. At the end of Parshat Sav, chapter, the end of chapter 8 of Vayikra, Moshe said to Aaron and his sons, boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of meeting. They've now set up the tent of meeting. They just haven't consecrated it yet or started the offer offerings. So take this. We've been giving lots of instructions about the sacrifice. And eat it there with the bread that is in the installation basket. Sal miluim. Some people translate miluim as ordination. But that seems to be the term. It really comes from the word for fullness. The term for in the inauguration or the installation of the priestly uh, role and of, and of the temple or of the portable temple, the Mishkan. As I commanded, Kasher Tziveti, saying, Aaron his son shall eat it, and what is left of the flesh and the bread you shall burn in fire. From the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall not go out for seven days until the day of completion of your days of installation. For seven days shall your installation be. Moshe sort of breaks into free verse poetry um, with uh, that sort of chiastic verse there. As it was on this day, Adonai has commanded to do to atone for you. And at the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall sit day and night for seven days. And you shall keep Adonai's watch. That you may not die, for so I have been commanded. Kichen Suveti. And Aaron and his sons did all the things that Adonai had commanded through Moshe. But where we left things, we are architecturally, physically ready to begin the sacrificial cult. We are ready to inaugurate a home for God among the people. Remember that God commanded back in Parshat Truma. Um, the construction of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle, 
um, God said the purpose of it was v'shachanti b'tocham, so that I can dwell not in it, but among them, among the people. For God to be with us, God needs to have some sort of vessel, whether that's for God's purpose, whether that's for our purpose, because unmediated, the presence of God would be overwhelming, they would die. The indication from Revelation Mount Sinai indicates that people could take it. Um, um, so the stakes are high. People were desperately wanting God to continue to be among the people. And here, the physical construction is done. Everything is set up and ready to go, but there needs to be an inauguration ceremony. And we dramatically ended Parshat Sav with Aaron and his four sons sitting watch for seven days, a seven day quarantine of watch, maybe so that they could rehearse all the meticulous instructions for the inauguration, which will happen on the eighth day, maybe to go over and to get spiritually ready, maybe to make sure that they are in a state of purity so that nothing can go wrong for the very high stakes inauguration. In other words, how do we transition from mundane to holy? Or how do we transition from the typical to the unusual? How do we transition from the low stakes to the high stakes? And it takes meticulous preparation. Our own and the sons separate for a week. They sit watch, Ushmar Temet Mishmeret Adonai, at the entrance to the tent of meeting, not going inside for seven days. Um, I want to just note already this, I hear echoes of the Korban Pesach here, the Pesach sacrifice, which was also called Leil Shimurim, a night of watch, that same word, Ushmar Temet Mishmeret Adonai, you shall keep Adonai's watch. That was the, the, the watch night back then another high stakes night of transition of God's presence. God was going to go out, um, you know, physically, personally into Egypt, and it was going to be lethal. And so people had to be following the instructions meticulously, and there was a period of preparation. In that case, there was 14 days leading up to the Korban Pesach, and it's followed by seven days of Chag HaMatzot, the festival of Matzah. Um, I think there are echoes of that, of a dangerous time that includes preparation that is keeping watch on Mishmeret. That's where we left it. It's been quite a, uh, a cliffhanger, even if we've gotten distracted with other very dramatic things in the Pesach story. From that, we transition into this week's Parsha, and this is where we begin. I want us to pay attention. I haven't brought the entirety of that chapter nine where most of the action happens. I've just brought what I think are some significant motifs, recurring motifs here so that we can discuss what is really uh, at stake. And I think this is gonna be useful background so we can understand what's going right as well as what's going wrong. So the beginning of our Parsha, and it happened, Vayahi, on the eighth day, and Moshe called to Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, etc., 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 and gave them a lot of instructions about the different uh, spec specifications for um, sacrifices, etc. This is the thing, and Moshe said, this is the thing that Adonai has commanded you, that in order that the glory of Adonai, Kavod Adonai, may appear to you. That's the reminding us of the purpose. So that whatever kavod Adonai means, God's kavod, God's glory, God's dignity, God's honor, so that that can have a chance to have space to dwell among us. Moshe said to Aaron, come forward to the altar and do your purification offering, the chatat, and your burnt offering, the olah, and atone for yourself and for the people, and do the people's offering and atone for them as Adonai commanded, etc., etc., other details, and Aaron's sons brought the blood to him, etc., etc., and the fat and the kidneys and the lobe from the liver, from the purification offering, he turned into smoke on the altar, as Adonai had commanded Moshe. And he brought forward the burnt offering and did it according to regulation, etc., 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 the breast and the right thighs, Aaron elevated in an elevation offering before Adonai, as Moshe had commanded. 
And Aharon lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from having done the purification offering and the burnt offering and the offering of well-being. And Moshe and Aaron came into the tent of meeting and went out and blessed the people. And the glory of Adonai appeared to all the people. And a fire went out from before Adonai and consumed on the altar the burnt offering and the fat. And the people saw and shouted with joy by Aaronu and fell on their faces. It seems like everything has happened with unspeakable drama exactly as it was supposed to happen. They did everything, the rehearsal worked, they went through it. God's glory appears to the people. A fire comes out from God. Imagine this, the, the meat is there on the table, on the altar. And a fire comes down and consumes it. This is not an ordinary, uh, an ordinary function, a divine function, and consumes it. All the people see it. I don't shout it with joy. I don't, I don't know if there's a great uh, English rendering that captures the word rina. Rina is a word for shouting or a song um, that expresses jubilation. And they fell on their faces. Immediately after that, the chapter breakups, remember, are Christian uh, interventions into the text. Um, in the rabbinic, in, in the, the script of the text, there's no break here, and in the rabbinic divisions, there's no break. So we're really one verse after the other. So this great drama, the people are celebrating, falling on their faces, they're jubilant, they're overwhelmed. Divine fire just came out and consumed the sacrifices. It worked. And the sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, took each man his fire pan, put fire on it, laid incense on it, and they brought forward before Adonai alien fire, strange fire, Esh Zara, which, had, which God had not commanded them. And fire came forth from before Adonai, just like before, and consumed them, and they died before Adonai. And Moshe said to Aaron, this is as Adonai spoke, saying, through those close to me shall I be hallowed, and in all the people's presence shall I be honored. And Aaron was silent. I want to pause there, and I'll stop the screen share, and I'll open it up um, for some discussion for a little bit. Um, one of, and then after we have some discussion, um, we'll look at some other passages, um, including some rabbinic passages. But right now, I want to draw your opinions. You can raise your virtual hand, um, or if you find that difficult, uh, you can put in the chat that you want to uh, you want to speak. Um, why did Nadav and Avihu die? Let's start with Jay Allen. Well, I think the problem that a lot of people, myself included, have in this portion is that it's very undefined as to what alien fire means. And we always teach our students and our kids that um, to try new things, to not be afraid to do new things. And here, Nadav and Abihu tried something new and they died from because of it. So that's a problem that I know a lot of people have in this portion. And then the idea that Aaron is silent is Aaron's in shock. He just lost his two oldest sons and he's probably still trying to con comprehend what just happened. Right, thank you, Jay. Tanya Evans, go ahead. Why did Nadav and Avihu die? Well, Rabbi, as you know, there are a lot of speculations and a lot of theories. Maybe they had, uh, maybe they were drunk, but, you know, obviously there was some kind of breach of protocol. And uh, I remember back in the book of Shemot, Moses took Adab and Navihu along with Aaron and some of the elders and they went to the mountain. And Adab and Navihu had, had an opportunity to see God. And uh, it was really fascinating because the Holy Scripture says that no man should see God and live. And I just wondered if that passage 
in the book of Shemot had something to do with what happened on the day of the inauguration of the Mishkan, of the, of the priest. I'm sorry. That's a great, we're going to, I love the, the foreshadowings there, Tanya, the great things you're bringing up. We will look at a rabbinic statement in a few minutes that I think might tap into part of what you're bringing up. Um, I'm noticing Jan Mira writes in the chat, it almost seems like they died just as an example, an opportunistic example. They just happened to do something right after the first fire coming down. So God used them as an example. Jen, would you like to unmute and share an example of what? What do we learn from it? It, it, it seems as if an example of if you don't follow my rules exactly as I stated with any, any variation will not be tolerated. And here is a, here's a way for me to, to show. So, so like the plagues, the plagues were a big deal. They were huge. They were seen by everyone. And they went throughout the land and everyone knew, you don't follow God, this is what you get. It, it seems to tie kind of with that to me. Great. Jen, I, I'm hearing connections between what you're saying and what Jay said at the beginning and being troubled. It seems like there's this uh, strong emphasis on... Um, following exact protocol, exact instructions, and not, and not deviating. And Jay raised that as a problem. Don't we actually encourage people to create and innovate? And, you know, I wonder, like, so if, if that's the case, and that's actually, by the way, exactly how um, Necham Leibowitz, the great 20th century Bible scholar and teacher, that's her explanation, consistent with the theology of her and her brother, the philosopher and chemist, that this is a signature example that devotion to God is about obedience and a meticulous fulfilling of duty. And that always leaves me a little bit troubled though, because, well, then why didn't a strange fire come down and consume Miriam and Moshe when they innovated the Song of the Sea? That wasn't a commanded response, and it's become a major part of our liturgy, of our, of our, daily liturgy and our practice and our mythos. There was um, the, the Midrash wonders like how the transition happened for the Bnei Israel going into the sea. They weren't actually commanded explicitly to go in and the Midrash fills in that the parting didn't come till after Nachshon started to take the first step. They took initiative. There was creativity involved there. Or how about Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, on Mount Carmel, when he was taunting the Nivea Baal, the priests of Baal, and innovating an entire worship, and God, uh, God validated him, vindicated him by accepting his sacrifice. So why doesn't a strange, why doesn't a fire from God come out and consume Elijah? Then I want to, I, I want to hear what Jay and um, and Jen were saying, and actually make sure we're not flattening this question. I want us to be not just satisfied with the Nechama Leibovitz response there. What, what is it about this particular situation? If you're, in, if you're reading, if you think the text is demonstrating that meticulous adherence to protocol and obedience is necessary here, why is it here and not in other places? And how do we learn that discernment? Let's go to, I see Bruce and Suzanne. Yeah, I mean, I want to touch just really briefly on something Tanya made reference to. I, I think there, and this has sometimes been the case in the Torah, there's something that's missing here that we don't know. There's something else that is, has happened and we're not filled in on the details because this is brutal by any measure. I mean, this, to, to, this uh, is one of the hallmark examples of many in the Torah of, you know, causing people to be God-fearing. I mean, if anything is, is gonna make you fear God, it's seeing two, Aaron's two eldest sons die this way, you know, in what appears to be, you know, what, what we don't know was something that far out of the protocol or, or something so critical. So I, I really kind of 
have always felt this brutal story has details that we, we either will have to speculate on or imagine to explain such a, uh, an incident. Thanks, Bruce. Go ahead, Suzanne. Un unmute yourself. Excuse me. I think it's a matter of pride. I think that when Aaron's sons did their own things, so to speak, it was partially out of pride, partially out of their ego. When Miriam started singing, I think it was out, it was a natural reaction of appreciation and gratitude. It was a spontaneous reaction, I would think. And it was out of her love and appreciation for God. It wasn't about herself. Mm -hmm. It was about oh, oh, you could couldn't you just as easily say that about Nadav and Avihu? They are overwhelmed with joy. They are part of the Vayaronu, the jubilant joy, shouting for joy of the people. And in that moment of the spirit entering them with such joy and uh, overwhelmed joy, the presence of God, they're uh, they're filled with the spirit, and they offer another offering. Why not? Why not that? That seems like a very similar energy to me. They added to what God did. So did, Miriam Mary... Moses, so did Miriam with the Song of the Sea. God didn't command that song. That's an innovation. I don't see it as the same thing. So uh, unpack a little bit. Where do you see? Where do you see the difference there? They, the sons added to what God required. It, it was um, an addition to something that was already ordained or decided. Mm -hmm. Miriam <clears throat> did not add to what God said to do. This was purely from her heart. It wasn't a one-upmanship. It wasn't beautiful. improving upon what God did. Beautiful, beautiful. So the Torah, the, the Torah says in another context about the mitzvot, follow all the mitzvot, lo tosif alav, lo tigara mimenu, do not add upon the mitzvot, do not detract from the mitzvot, do all the mitzvot. Exactly. And, but that doesn't mean that there may be areas for creativity where God right. has left it open for how to respond. The Song of the Sea is a beautiful example of filling an open space of drama and the presence of God with creative response. And Nadav and Avihu are maybe exercising a similar energy, but in an inappropriate place because it's a place that has been marked by, um, by instruction. Very good. Um, Mike, yeah, go ahead. You can finish up, Suzanne. Suzanne, if you're speaking, you muted yourself. We could also look at Moses. When he hit the rock, God did not say hit the rock. He's, he said point to it. And Moses added to what God said to do. So in a way, for that moment, he usurped God's position. And... Um, maybe out of doubt mm -hmm. or um, just like an extra oomph. So there's a big difference. What's, if I can sum up what Suzanne is saying, there's a big mm -hmm. difference between, um, between um, adding or amending, adding, inst inserting creativity when God has given very specific instructions on what to do. Yeah. Versus inserting creativity when God has stayed back and not given instructions for how to respond. And like that's exactly great. Thank you, Suzanne. We'll have two more comments, Michael and Lois, and then um, we'll look back. We'll look back at the text and look at a few other things. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, Michael I missed asked. a moment or two when my software blew up, so I, hopefully I'm not being repetitive. But uh, I think I have read that there are some parallels in the language here to the Garden of Eden story. Um, and, you know, uh, there, were, there were boundaries in place that said, here's what you can do and here's what you can't do. Um, and, you know, I've heard uh, comparisons made to the, 
kind of like the third uh, rail on a subway. It's electrified. They stepped over the boundaries. Now to us humans, this seems incomprehensible even in their children. But if you look at Moses' language, he's sort of saying, you guys became the sacrifice as an offering to God. Now to us, it sounds awful. I mean, you can't comprehend it, but we don't know what happened to their souls. The rabbis certainly don't understand it because they make up a bunch of reasons why in Midrash that it died, but none of those really, you know, are, comp none of those feel right. You mean, you, well, you read, momentarily, you know, moment, momentarily, we'll look at some of those Midrashim and I want to demonstrate how all of them actually are grounded textually. Um, it's a complicated situation. So what exactly is like right. essential and what's like extra, like we'll have, there, there's room for debate. But I, I would just push back on they're making stuff up. I don't think they're making up. I think they're drawing out and trying to read a complicated high stakes situation as, as we are. They're trying to understand it as we are trying to understand understand yeah. it but i think it also points to there is a way to get too close to god yeah and, and not even who wanted to go the extra mile that they weren't given the you know the permission to do and somehow they stepped over the line and it caused this accident for god to break loose on them Thanks, Michael. Lois Copeland, last comment for this round, and then we'll, we'll go back to the text. I think that uh, the portion leaves us with um, no explanation on why they died. I mean, even Moses had trouble explaining why they died. You can point to the sons doing so many things, you know, many things wrong, not in, not in accordance with what was supposed to be done, but it, it doesn't explain why they had su you know, such a, a horrible, horrible death. And so I think it just leaves us without an explanation of, of why instead of punishing them that, that um, God decided to annihilate them. I, I, I just don't think we're left with an explanation. Okay, thank you, Lois. We're gonna look back, um, look back at the text. Um, <coughs> it's a very terse passage. After uh, this is, I think, uh, in a great example of where form, literary form, is content. The fact that we have so much text about the preparation, the instructions, and then just these two verses about the fulfillment and then two verses about the unraveling is both to indicate to us the duration of rehearsal the sense of like how much preparation is necessary for a brief glimpse and brief encounter of of god which is really like anyone who's worked in conference planning or party planning or event planning the have deal uh understands actually how much time has to go into organizing, you know, like a one day event, um, months and months and months of meticulous planning for that. Um, but there's a lot of themes. Notice what I highlighted here in the end of Parshat Sav and at the beginning of Parshat Shmini over and over and over again. The Torah repeats, instead of just saying, you know, once Moshe said to Aaron, do all these things which God has commanded and here are all the things. Each item, as I commanded, as God has commanded for you to do, keep God's watch, which is a sense of nervous, you know, protection. For I have been commanded. For Adonai is commanded. Adonai is commanded you. Adonai is commanded. As Adonai commanded, according to regulation, everything Moshe Aaron did was according to regulation, as as Moshe had commanded, etc. When everything comes goes right, the fire comes out, consumes. The, uh, the sacrifices and the people shout with joy, that is when Aaron did what he had been commanded according to regulation and as Moshe commanded. Re immediately after that, 
the sons of Aharon, Adav, and Avihu took each man his fire pan, put fire on it, laid incense on it, and they brought forward before Adonai Eshzara, foreign, strange fire, Asher Lo Tziva Otam. The, the main motif of the entire preparation here was as God commands, as God commands, as God commands. It's, Moshe is repeating incessantly. There's one message you need to get. This is a thing that has to be done according to script. And the Davan Abihu did something, Asher Lo Tziva Utam, that same language, Tziva, which had been repeated several times, do it as God commanded. They did it, Asher Lo Tziva Utam. So one thing to focus on is this Eish Zara, a strange fire, a foreign fire. Another thing to focus on is Asher Lo Tziva Utam. And even the way we lane it, the way we re- chant it, there's an unusual, long, acrobatic musical trope under the word lo to really emphasize. Asher lo tziva otam, to really emphasize they were going against protocol, against divine commandment. Another clue so if somebody mentioned that, you know, the rabbi said, or Tanya mentioned that she heard, like, maybe they were drunk. That isn't just said out of, you know, well, we have no explanation for this thing, so we must, uh, why else, you know, what they did seems fine, so it must be that there was another problem. And that's also a textual cue. Immediately afterwards, so verse 4 through 7, right after this, is Moshe giving commandments to the cousins, uh, Misha Allen El Safan to remove the corpses and how to prevent this terrible thing from getting worse. How, like, how do you remove the corpse, corpses and bury them, etc., um, while the service for the concentra- consecration goes on? The next thing that happens in verse 8, God speaks to Aaron. That is, does not happen very often. Usually God speaks to Moshe and Moshe speaks to Aaron, or sometimes God speaks to the two of them together. Um, this is either the only or one of the only two or three places in the Torah where God speaks to Aaron directly, saying, Wine and liquor do not drink, you and your sons with you, when you enter the tent of meeting, that you may not die. This is an eternal law for your generations. And to distinguish, lahavdil, ben kodesh lachol, ben atameh, ben atahor, between the sacred and the profane, between the impure and the pure, and to teach the Israelites all the laws which Adonai has spoken to them by the hand of Moshe. So when Rabbi Ishmael in the Midrash, Rashi records this in his comment, says it must be the Nadav and Avihu were Shtuye Yain, they were drunk on wine when they went in, it's, that's not just speculation, it's based on well, why did God immediately after this event command them not to enter drink. Now the other viewpoints who don't say that they were drunk might say, well, this is just another, the prohibition against wine and drink is another, Nadav and Avihu had a problem of misperceiving what they needed to do at that moment, of being in really focused, grounded um, uh, mindset. Wine, Wine and drink are another cause for how that might get undone, but the point here is really on Havdalah. Our whole language of Havdalah, when we distinguish between Shabbat and, uh, and the rest of the week, when, you know, the whole reason we light Havdalah candle, and the whole reason we light candles before Shabbat is because we're not allowed to light fire on Shabbat, so as soon as Shabbat's over, and we verbally declare it, we light a fire to indicate, to show that Havdalah, to distinguish between sacred and profane. That's uh, what's going on here. Later in chapter 16, chapter Parshat Achare Mot, which comes to be understood as the, uh, the rites for Yom Kippur, we see another reference by the Bear Adonai Moshe Achare Mot Shnei B'nei Haron. Adonai spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aharon, Vekorvatam Lifnei Adonai Ve'amutu, who came forward before Adonai and died. So if we might have thought that the problem was offering strange fire or fire that hadn't been commanded. Here, this verse indicates that it wasn't their 
their hakrava, they're bringing forth something else that was problematic, but the, the kirva, the coming close themselves, um, they're drawing forward, they, they crossed a boundary, and that's why uh, they died. And Adonai then speaks to Moshe, speak to Aaron, your brother, that he not come at, at any time, at all times, into the sacred zone, the Kodesh, within the curtain, lest he die. So it's about boundaries and when you come in and at the right time in this one time a year for the inauguration. And yet another time in Bamidbar, Numbers chapter 3, when Aaron's genealogy is mentioned, says these are the names of our own sons, Nadav and Avihu, Elazar and Itamar, those are the names of our own sons, the anointed priest, but Nadav and Avihu died before Adonai when they brought forward Bahakrivam Eshzara Lifne Adonai, the Midbar Sinai. So we see the Torah kind of dancing around these few explanations. Was it they're drawing close when they didn't respect the boundary? Was it bringing forth something that wasn't according to protocol? Was it that um, the, the particular offering was itself intrinsically a foreign offering outside of protocol? Or was it just that you know, like as the, the phrase Eish Zara might indicate a foreign fire, or was it that just the timing was foreign? It wasn't commanded at this moment, or maybe it's just everything they did was fine, but they weren't supposed to come forward at this moment. Or maybe it's that they were stuye yain, that they were drunk, and that's why immediately afterwards God commands our own saying, don't ever come in drunk. Now you see what happens. I want to suggest that all of these explanations, when we see, when we hear different rabbis in the Midrashim um, uh, saying, when we hear different rabbis in the Midrashim saying that um, different opinions, they died because they were stuya yain, because they were drunk. They died because they brought forward something for them. They died because they came too close. I agree with Jen's comment, but aren't all of these boundary issues? I think there's really a collective issue here, and it goes back to the questions that uh, that came up at the beginning. Um, Nechama Leibovitz is both spot on and I think tragically wrong. Uh, not only her, but she's just one of the most famous versions of it um, in reading this passage. I think it is uh, unescapable that the explanation for Nadav and Avihu's death here, literally, in terms of following the cues of the Torah, is that protocol and commandment were not followed. This setting is all about nervous, insistent need to follow exact protocol, because this is a dangerous situation. Nechama Leibovitz says, Therefore, we learn from this that all divine devotion is about literal, full-fledged, uncreative following of protocol and commandments, and that is it. To me, that is the equivalent of hearing the adage when you're a child, don't play with fire, and taking that to mean don't play. When parents tell their children don't play with fire, that doesn't mean that they're opposed to children playing tag playing with blocks, jumping around in puddles, doing somersaults. They're saying don't play with fire because fire is lethal. And over and over, the language of the Torah is unusual here for this particular event. What we're about to do is something extremely dangerous. We are going as close as we can get. We're bringing this uh, bringing God and human as close together as possible. Remember, last time we saw that at Mount Sinai, the people were so freaked out that they said, stop, don't talk to us directly. Moshe, you be an intermediary. And they, they melted down. And beforehand, God said, three days, separate, get yourself in a state of purity, and don't touch the mountain. If you touch the mountain, it's going to be radioactive. You can't do it. It's dangerous. As a person, I operate, I really live in like the world of community organizing. And um, I, I think about it in this context. Let's say there was a mass action, protest, demonstration action that involved a confrontation with the police. 
the police are of course all armed. You cannot, cannot, cannot in that context have a freelancer shooting up, operating from the hip, doing something spontaneous that's off script. If the organizing team has prepared meticulously for different scenarios and how they're going to act, what risks they're going to take, who's going to take risks, who's been trained to take risks, um, and what risks they're going to take. The last thing you want is somebody going in because at the moment they get taken by the spirit of bravery and they go forward and do something provocative. That might get somebody shot. You can't do it. However, the same energy that animated Nadav and Avihu in that moment might actually be the same e energy. That might be the same kind of personality that in another section, like after you've just seen God drown your oppressors, the most powerful army in the world, and then God vanishes, and you're breathing heavily and trying to figure out what to do, this same hothead energy might be the same energy that enables you to figure out how to move forward and how to capture this event. I'll go deeper. There's another example of this that I think, where I think um, the same energy of Nadav and Abihu is manifested in a risky but appropriate way in Pinchas. In the Pinchas story, we also see an example of something very dangerous going on. There's a mass communal orgy between the Israelites and the Midianites and Moabites, and all hell is breaking loose. The leadership has lost control. God is livid. Moshe and the rest of the leadership seem immobilized, whereas here the literary theme is meticulous following of protocol and getting the script down. Over there, the literary motif is God gives a command to Moshe for how to deal with this loss of control. Moshe doesn't follow God's command, but does something different, tells a different group of leaders to do something different. They don't do anything. And meanwhile, even Israelite leaders are flaunting uh, authority. You know, a, a Shimonite leader takes a Midianite priestess and they copulate in front of everybody in order to taunt Moshe and God. And in that situation where there are no instructions, you have somebody, maybe somebody with Nadav and an Avihu type energy, their nephew, I guess, cousin Pinchas, uh, the other nephew, Pinchas, coming forward and figuring out what to do. And it's effective. It stops the plague when he stabs the two of them um, exactly in the right place. Um, there are times when everything is in free fall, where it's necessary for somebody with uh, the courage and the bravery and the energy for dramatic creativity to step forward. But Havdalah, our Parsha is telling us, you really need to know the time for that and the time not for that. And here, it's these two people with immense privilege Somebody said in the comment that like, you know, they, they weren't properly prepared. They were totally prepared. They were there in the seven day preparation quarantine. They knew all the protocol. They really knew better. And I think it's a question here when we think about creativity to really interrogate how privilege can interrupt the appropriate uh, judgment for creativity. There might've been lots of other people overcome with creativity too, but who maybe thought, well, it's not my place to break forward. And Dav and Avihu, the high priest sons, they think, oh, well, yeah, I can make this my moment. And in fact, there's a rabbinic, uh, there's a rabbinic comment um, in uh, the, the Midrash Sifra that actually, even going back at Mount Sinai, like they had their eyes on Moshe and Aaron who were getting all this glory and they're saying, we're going to have our day soon enough. Soon these two old ones will die and we're going to lead the congregation. And then a cutter's birth says, well, we'll see who's going to bury whom. They're going to bury you and they're going to lead the, co the congregation. There's no room. There are times when there's no room for 
stepping out of role. That's not creativity. That's irrigation of, of duty and, um, and acting out of immense uh, privilege and entitlement. That's, I think, how we understand Rabbi Eliezer's ruling, which we see in the Talmud as well as in the Midrash Sifra, that Nadav and Abihu died because they issued a halachic ruling before Moshe. In other words, the point is, right now is not your time to be innovating. We have protocol here. There might be times when Moshe doesn't have anything to say. That's Pinchas. Knowing the appropriate time for innovation and creativity and knowing the appropriate time to, to hold back and follow protocol. I think that's really the lesson of our parashat.